From the editorial team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel. And this is Hello Monday, a show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. Leah Busky Sullivan is not who you'd picture as an entrepreneur. She's from Boston and went to a tiny college in Virginia. She graduated in 2001 when no one was starting companies. And she's a programmer. I am an introvert. I am a fake extrovert. Put me, you know, in a cube for 10 hours a day and tell me to go code this project and I'm like happy as a clam. But Leah was a problem solver. Eight years into cubicle life, she came up with the solution to a problem she had. She needed dog food delivered. And I grabbed my iPhone, which had only come out four months earlier. There was no app store, right? This was like early, early days of the iPhone. And I popped open the browser and I said, OK, if, if a site existed where I could get dog food on demand, what would it be called? You might have already guessed, but Leah started TaskRabbit, the online marketplace where people get help with small jobs like cleaning or building furniture. She helped build it into a multi-million dollar business. And then in 2017, Ikea bought it. Now as an investor, Leah specializes in identifying other good startup founders and ideas. Through her own experience and by getting to know and fund many other entrepreneurs, she's gotten very good at telling the difference between a cool idea and a promising business. And she's learned that an MBA isn't nearly as important to a company's success as drive, persistence, and knowing who to ask for help. Here's Leah. Why did you fall in love with computers? Like, what was it? Sweetbriar was a a small women's college. What was its program like? So, you know, there was one class that I took, uh, which was C++ programming. And it was, for me, kind of the key to unlocking, I think, this skill set I had inside of myself, which is I love languages. I grew up in a household where we spoke both Spanish and English. My father is Puerto Rican. My grandparents only spoke Spanish. And I saw C++ programming as another language. And so I loved learning it. And the fact that I could learn a language that would help me realize these ideas I had in my head And not only put them down on paper, but put them down into a program that other people could use and interact with. I mean, actually, that was mind blowing to me. And now you were coming out of college in in the early aughts, right? Or like the very early aughts. So pre-Facebook, right? I graduated in 2001. Did you understand one of your options at that point might be at some point to go and found a company? No, not not at all. No, I had no exposure to entrepreneurship, no exposure to startups or companies or anything of that sort at the time. And in fact, because there was this tech crisis happening, particularly in Silicon Valley, it was really hard to get a tech job. All right, let's stop here a minute. Leah's talking about when the dot-com bubble burst in 2000. Overnight, the startup money was gone. Entire companies closed. I was living in San Francisco at the time. And all of a sudden, you didn't need to make reservations at restaurants. And there were parking spaces everywhere. I was on the East Coast. And so I think actually, you know, the East Coast to me, I grew up here in this area. I think the East Coast can be a little bit more like pragmatic and a little bit more realistic. And so I think it was a great place actually to come out of school in 2001 as a programmer because I could go find like a solid programming job at a solid company like IBM and Lotus, you know, and really start to develop my career there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If you had to distill what you learned at that first job down to one thing, what would it be? I actually think it was about building great software that connected people and, and what it meant to do that. As an engineer, for me anyway, It was always really exciting to understand that code that I was building that I kind of, you know, typed up and and checked into the system was going to get utilized by someone somewhere around the globe. And it was going to somehow make their life more productive or more efficient or more collaborative. And to me, that was like the greatest gift uh, as an engineer that I could receive that whatever impact I was having, whatever I was contributing was being utilized by someone else. And I think I really learned, um, you know, that lesson and that gift with my time at IBM. 
And what happened in your broader life during that period of time that brought you to the point where you thought, I know what entrepreneurship is, and also I think I'm going to give it a try? Well, I don't think I ever actually got to the point where I knew what entrepreneurship was. <laughs> we're still working on that one. Yeah, we're still working on that one, for sure. No, it's funny. I mean, I was eight years at IBM. I would say about five years in, I started to get a little bit antsy, a little bit bored. I started to think gosh, I feel like I have other skill sets I could be utilizing on a daily basis. But here at IBM, I'm in a cube, I have headphones on, and I program eight to 10 hours a day. And that's what I do. And I actually loved it. I I loved it. Can we take a moment on that one? Like, what is it about you that that work really appealed to you? Well, I think it was a couple things. One, um, I am an introvert. I'm a fake extrovert. I mean, put me, you know, in a cube for 10 hours a day and tell me to go code this project. And I'm like happy as a clam. I don't have to talk to anyone. I can just it's all internal in my head. I also really love puzzles. Mm -hmm. And I always did as a child growing up. And so I think there's this aspect to me around programming and building software that is a puzzle. You're just trying to figure out where the pieces go in the most efficient way of how to build it. And so I love that aspect of it, too. And then I think with my math background, I'm very analytical. And so, you know, the numbers and the coding and the algorithms were always really interesting to me. So it fed me on a lot of different levels. But there was also this gap. I mean, we joke that I'm a fake extrovert. And I I do I am able, you know, to to be very social and outgoing and um, engaging and enthusiastic. And so that wasn't a skill set that I used at IBM. Right. And I didn't see really a path there to utilize those skills. And in fact, you know, an area that I think I would have been really good at at IBM was interfacing with the customer. But because IBM is so large, so 400,000 people, there are whole teams where it's their singular job to interface with the customer. It wouldn't be my job as an engineer to do that. And so I think what I realized is, is that doing something smaller and more entrepreneurial would allow me to explore a lot of different skill sets that I knew that I had that would be difficult to utilize in a big company. So what was the process of coming to the idea that you were going to try to develop? Well, you know, TaskRabbit was not the first idea I had for a company. Um, And I don't think I've shared this uh, too many times, maybe if at all, ever. But, you know, five years in, I got a little antsy. Sort of the last three years at IBM... I was starting to look around and interviewing at other companies. I kind of got exposure to startups by interviewing at different companies around Boston. And then I started to have ideas of my own. And one of those ideas I remember was in the real estate space. And I was thinking, you know, if I could build a more content-driven marketplace around houses that are for sale, like people might enjoy that content. It might help them make buying purchases. I had no background in business. Um, at all. You know, I, I didn't go get Yeah, my... you're throwing these words around that sound very MBA-ish. And I do not have an MBA. <laughs> what you just described it sounds a little bit like Zillow meets HDTV. Actually, if, if you could have been there at that moment with me 12 years ago, <laughs> maybe I would have solidified that idea. Well, which is to say, it sounds like a great idea. Like, yeah. what's the difference between a great idea and something that's worth pursuing? <laughs> So in that case, you know, I did sort of code nights and weekends on the side and I got a little site launch, but I wasn't super passionate about it. Right. It was just an idea. I think to your question, what makes an idea worth pursuing is different for every single person that you talk to. And I think the key lies in how passionate you are about that idea, because there are hundreds of millions of great ideas out there in the world. And I don't pretend to be the first person that had the idea for TaskRabbit. Lots of people had the idea for TaskRabbit before I had it. But it was my passion behind the opportunity I saw and what I was building that actually allowed me to execute that idea. So tell us about how you came up with the idea for TaskRabbit. It was February of 2008. I remember it was February because I was living in Boston and it was cold and snowing outside. And it was one of those really stormy, snowy nights. And I'd called a cab to come uh, pick me up and take me across town to meet friends for dinner when I realized that I was out of dog food. And I thought there's got to be an easy way to get 
this dog food? Like, this is such a simple problem. Why isn't there a simple solution? Am I going to stop on the way home? What if all the stores are closed? If I stop on the way there, I'm going to have this big bag of dog food with me at dinner. This doesn't make sense. And so as an engineer, I thought, you know, what could I, what could I build, you know, to, to solve this problem? And I grabbed my iPhone, which had only come out four months earlier. There was no app store, right? Early this was days. like early, early days of the iPhone. And I popped open the browser and I said, okay, if, if a site existed where, you know, I could get dog food on demand, what would it be called? And the first thing that came to my mind was runmyerrand.com. And so I typed it into the browser and it was available. And so I bought it on the spot for $6.99. $6.99. Correct. Yes. <laughs> All right. And I thought, huh, that's kind of interesting. And then I boiled some chicken for the dog and made sure he ate. And then the your ca- dog eats well. Well, I mean, I was out of dog food. There was like nothing else to make him in the house. Fair I, enough. You know, that was the problem. And so the cab, you know, had come to pick me up and take me across town to dinner to meet friends. And um, that's where the idea was born. That's where the idea was born. But certainly, so you had this idea, then what? So had the idea. I bought the domain name. I went to dinner that night. And I shared it with friends. And I said, you know, oh, it's interesting. I just had this idea. Kobe, my dog, he's out of dog food. And they're like, oh, that is interesting. That must exist. That must exist somewhere. I'm like, I don't know. I've got to, like, do more research on this. And so it was over the course of the next four months. I was still working at IBM. But I just became obsessed with this idea. And I did a bunch of research, and I tried to find other sites that did it. I remember one day uh, Googling and finding a site. I forget what it was called. But it, it, was this ex- it was the exact idea. And they were out of Texas, and it was some, like, errand running site. I'm like, oh, it's already been done. It's already been done. Maybe I should just quit now. Yeah, so, so if you were seeing it other places, and as someone who covers startups, I mean, I, I've always seen this. There are often a lot of the same idea, and then one rises. What inside you made you think, well, I, I got this one. Like, I, I can keep working on this one and I can do it the best. I think it was more so that I personally couldn't let it go. And I didn't know enough that, you know, I felt like, oh, I'm going to get out there and compete and crush these other companies that have already started. It was more just like, none of my friends have heard about this other company. Like, I know how to build this, and I have a real passion for it. I'm just going to see how far I can take it. And it was actually um, uh, a guy by the name Scott Griffith, who at the time was the CEO of Zipcar. I didn't know him in advance, but I got connected to him through a friend of a friend of a friend. I ended up at his office one day chatting with him about this idea. And he said to me, I think you're really on to something. Why don't you just see how far you can take it? And I was still at IBM at the time, but I sort of saw that as a challenge. <laughs> and I like challenges. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to see how far I can push this idea. And I, I ended up quitting IBM in the next week and just coding the first version of the site and putting it out there to see what would happen. Did you have any money at that point? It was this like money in the savings account from eight years at a tech firm in your early 20s? Pretty much. I mean, it's a good analysis, actually. Um, yeah, I used my IBM pension, which, you know, you're not supposed to touch until you retire. But it was $27,000 that I could access uh, with some penalties. <laughs> 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 and so I took out the pension. I took out that money. I was 28 years old at the time and decided to see how far I could push it with that little bit of funding and then kind of maxing out credit cards. And just, uh, I gave myself six to nine months to see if I could really get, I mean, it didn't even feel like a company at that point, I would say. It was like this product, this idea I had, to get the idea to a place where I felt like there was something interesting to invest in. And then from there, I would see what happened. I didn't have a grand plan at that point. And in 2008, we just finished the financial crash. So there were a lot of people out of work, and I guess a lot of people looking for work. That ended up playing to your favor, right? 
It did. And, you know, I'd like to say I had the foresight to see that coming. I did not. Um, I quit my job at IBM in June of 2008. And it was September, really, when that crisis hit. And the stock market was crashing and everyone was being laid off. And I had just left this cushy job at IBM where I was paid well. It was very stable. I was a young, up and coming, you know, programmer within the company. And so there were a couple moments where I thought to myself, gosh, like, what am I doing? But as you said, it turned out to be the best time to start a company like TaskRabbit because there were so many people looking for new ways of working. And we ended up starting to drive, um, you know, uh, the thinking and, and, and really become leaders in this future of work space at the time. So as I remember TaskRabbit, um, it over the course, well, it, first of all, it was part of an early group of companies that we looked at as a new model for what labor was going to do. I mean, the, the sort of early champions of it called the sharing economy. I think now the, the word that I tend to use is dis- distributed work. Um, I'm curious what it felt like to be grouped into those companies. I mean, honestly, it was a really exciting time because at that point, it was 2010, 2011, where the words the sharing economy really emerged. Rachel Botsman had written a book about collaborative consumption. And so it was becoming more mainstream, at least from a journalism standpoint, to to have this theme to discuss around the sharing economy and the future of work. But I had already been operating the company for two to three years prior to that. And I'd bootstrapped it for a long time. I'd gotten funding together at the end of 2009. So in some regards, it was early in the company's sort of financing history. But it was three years of me bootstrapping and operating it. So it was quite validating, actually, to see that this theme was emerging and that we had been there so early. I mean, really from the very beginning. Sometimes I think it was almost too early uh, because we had Uber, we had Lyft, we had other companies emerge like a year or two later. Right. And we, in the beginning, had to do a lot of the heavy lifting around building trust between users um, around creating. And when you say building trust, you just mean like that whole idea that I would go on the internet and volunteer to help a stranger clean her garage out or volunteer to have somebody come into my home and clean my garage out. It's kind of a crazy idea. It was insane. I mean, it was insane. I would talk to people and if I had told them in 2008, 2009, even early 2010, like, oh, you're going to be hailing strangers off the street like they're a cab and hopping in the backseat of their car, they would have thought I was insane. And it was the same thing with TaskRabbit. I'm going to invite this stranger into my home to hang shelves. I don't know this person. Why would I do that? And so it did take, in the beginning, a lot of trust building between users. And so things like ratings and reviews and profiles and building community and then leveraging, you know, things like what Facebook had built uh, around the social graph, meaning you could see, you know, who someone's friends are and how they were connected to other people so that... You know, say you and I are on Facebook and you hired, you know, Jamie to be a task rabbit. If I saw that you hired Jamie, I would be more likely to trace uh, trust Jamie as well. Right. So there was a lot of early thinking around how to use Facebook to build trust between people. And that was the precipice of what got us in to that incubator program in 2009. I'm assuming you had never been a CEO before. Um, you did not have a lot of business background. Where did you learn how to run a company? Yeah, so to be clear, I had zero business background. I mean, I really had no idea what I was getting into. So how did I learn? Um, one, I, I am the type of person that sort of feeds off learning new things. And I remember, you know, having a lot of self-doubt in the beginning and thinking, how am I going to figure this all out? I don't know how to start a company or operate a business. I don't know how to hire people, how to fire people, how to raise money. I thought, you know, if I raised money, what does that mean? What if the business fails? Do I have to give the money back? Like, I didn't even understand what it meant to, to do all of these things. But I remember having this conversation with myself one day, and I just said, you know what? This is not rocket science. You're going to figure it out. And I think in the end, I just decided that I was going to have enough confidence in myself to figure out whatever I needed to figure out. 
and then surround myself with as many smart people as possible. And so people like Scott Griffith at Zipcar made a huge difference to me early on. Sure. Because I could sit down with Scott and say like, okay, how does this financing thing work? Can you explain it to me? Just to cut in for a moment here, Leah spent nearly a decade at TaskRabbit. It wasn't a straight shot. There were a lot of questions still to figure out. But TaskRabbit went mainstream, and in the process, she'd hired a really strong number two, Stacy brown Philpot. Eight years in, Leah felt it was time to change things up. I was now pregnant with my second child. And by that point, the company was at a different size, scale, you know, approaching profitability, very stable. And I had recruited an amazing team around me. And so... It felt incredible, actually, to be able to say, you know what, at this moment, the time is right uh, for everyone to sort of level up. And so I moved to the board and became exec chair of the board. My COO, Stacy, I promoted to CEO. And then our VP of operations, Ian, we promoted to COO. So it's like, everyone look above you. That's your new role, (laughs) you know, and everyone take a step forward. Okay, so when did IKEA buy TaskRabbit? So that deal closed in October of 2017. Yes. So this sort of leads me to this question that is like the money question I've wanted to ask you. Um, you know, last last season we had Elizabeth Gilbert on the show and she had written Eat, Pray, Love. And then she had to figure out who she was after having written that great book. And I so often, yeah. I mean, it's such a good book, Incredible, right? yeah. It's an incredible book. Yeah. And here's the other thing. She's, she's written so many books, and most of them I haven't read, right? But I've read that one multiple times. And, and there are many people who do one major thing that the world sees and celebrates. Maybe it is the, maybe it is the reason for their financial success. Maybe it's their reason for their um, public success. Uh, And then you have to renegotiate an identity afterward. And I have to imagine that it's only 2019, that you're probably still in the process of doing that. And I wonder what that's like. Um, Yes, it's um, it is exciting. Um, It can also be terrifying. You know, it's funny when I was running TaskRabbit. And, and, you know, it was almost a decade from 2008 when I started to the sale in 2017. So a decade of my life, right, is defined by this company. And I thought, how am I ever going to do anything else? Like, what else am I going to do? I mean, I've just been so passionate and so consumed by this company and this brand. And it's, it is my baby. It, it is my firstborn. It really is. And I think, you know, as I reflected on what could I possibly do next? It became a few things became clear. One was I love innovation ideas in the earliest stages of the company. When I looked back on TaskRabbit, you know, just nostalgically, my favorite time was when we were under 10 people, you know, we were just sort of scrappy and working out of a one room office and just trying to figure things out. That was the most exciting time to me. You know, two, I remembered my roots as an engineer and as a technologist. And I realized that I had just spent almost a decade with my head down in one technology and one business to make sure that it was successful. But I missed out on a lot of new technologies that had emerged. I'd missed out on the blockchain, on virtual reality, on, you know, artificial intelligence and all these new emerging technologies that as an engineer and technologist, you know, I I would be really excited about if I had had the opportunity to explore them. And so the third thing I realized, and this is what ultimately pulled me in the direction of venture, is that I am, I feed off learning new things. It then sort of became obvious that I could utilize this decade I had just spent building and operating the company and parlay that into another career, which would be focused around investing, supporting, and helping early stage companies and entrepreneurs. And so, you know, I've been at Fuel Capital now for two years, and that has proven to be an incredible fit. And now, now I look back and I think, you know what? That decade at TaskRabbit prepared me for my dream job, right? That's like (laughs) the perfect fit for me. But when I was at TaskRabbit, I never could have seen that coming. 
Yeah, that's interesting. It makes me think about the beginning of our conversation when you said, well, you know, I spun through all of these ideas um, before I got to the idea that was the good idea. So you got very good early on at recognizing what the good idea was for you. How, when you're looking out at the world and talking to these entrepreneurs, do you figure out what is not only a good idea, but a good idea for that entrepreneur to take up and be successful with? Yes. It actually is part of the decision framework that Chris and I have when we meet companies. And we always ask ourselves and we ask the founders, how are you purpose built for this particular idea? And sometimes you meet founders that have great ideas and they'll come in and they'll be like, you know, my buddy and I, we just wanted to start a company and we came up with 10 ideas and like this is the one that we're focused on. You're kind of like, okay, but what happens when it gets really hard? And what happens when you hit that wall? Are you going to you gonna want to find a way around that wall? Are you going to bust through that wall? Are you going to climb over that wall? Like what is going to drive you? to continue forward. Because, I mean, building a startup from nothing is like not for the faint of heart. It's going to be hard. And so we really look for founders that are what we call purpose-built. They have a purpose that's beyond just the idea. They have a strong personal connection or story as to why, you know, this is the idea that they want to spend the next decade building. I would love to know what you would advise your own kids who are now still we, I mean, they're both still south of 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Like, What kind of workforce do you think they're coming into and, and what would you advise them? I mean, one of the things that struck me when I had children is how quickly they are able to not only adapt, but master technology, right? I mean, it's like when my little guy was 18 months old, he was like, on the iPad, like searching for things, like scrolling. I'm like, how do you know how to do that, right? There's a whole generation that's growing up where technology is leaps and bounds ahead of how I grew up. And so what that enables is the future of innovation for that generation is going to be leaps and bounds ahead of what we could possibly think of as possible and what we could possibly do in my generation. And so what's really exciting to me actually is just seeing these leapfrog moments of like, okay, great. You know, my kids are growing up with uh, a, a platform of tech and expectations around what that tech can do and what it should be able to do. And what are they going to create? I think is really exciting to think about. And you see it, I think with every generation. And, and I believe That's how humanity is pushed forward. That was Leah Busky Sullivan, founder of TaskRabbit and a partner at Fuel Capital. One of my favorite parts of that interview was when Leah said that her eight years at TaskRabbit set her up for her dream job. She didn't know it at the time, but letting go of her biggest project gave way to something even better. It's hard to walk away from jobs you love or have loved, jobs to which your very sense of identity is tied. And so I want to hear from you all on this. Did you ever let go of something only to discover something even better? If so, drop us a line at hellomonday at linkedin.com or post on LinkedIn using the hashtag hellomonday. If you enjoyed listening, subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts. It helps new listeners find the show. And join me next week for an episode dedicated to mornings. I'm obsessed with them, especially now that I share my mornings with a baby who thinks that every day should start at five. I'll be talking to Dan Pink, who wrote When, The Scientific Secrets of Good Timing. Dan believes timing is everything. And for most of us, mornings are go time. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show was produced by Laura Sim. Joe DiGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Oriando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. And you also heard music from Poddington Bear. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. See you next Monday. And thanks for listening. I'm curious, you're a technologist. Do you limit screen time for your kids? Oh, you know, I don't that much. I got to say, I've read studies both ways. My kids both do have, you know, iPads. They play a lot of games on the iPad, some of them educational, some of them not so educational. I don't know. I'm of the theory now, and I may take this back later, that 
I want them to be able to learn and grow up with a foundation of technology because I do believe it'll enable them in the future to do big things and great things. And I want to enable them to have it in a way where it doesn't feel like um, it's bad. It doesn't feel like it um, is a, only a special thing I only get to use at a certain time. Like I, I want it. I actually do want it integrated um, into how they're brought up and how they live. But I think at the same time, you know, being careful about balancing that is going to be very important, particularly as they get older. They're still pretty tiny. <laughs> 